in my uh, <clears throat> years of pastoral ministry, uh, being parts of uh, hundreds and hundreds of worship services, I'd safely say we're in the thousands now. What we're doing this evening, Good Friday, this remembering of what Jesus has done on our behalf would definitely be at the top of my favorite worship service list if I had one. The longer I've uh, walked with Jesus, the longer I've pastored people, the longer I've seen the beauty and hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ transform life after life, including my own, the more I've come to cherish the opportunity to gather on Good Friday and remember. And to remember in particular the resolve of Jesus. When we gathered uh, back at uh, Christmas Eve, <clears throat> I encouraged us to remember Jesus. And the reason for that is because I believe in the everydayness of life, we're constantly reminded of how easy it is, if you're anything like me, for our focus to be caught up with many other things. Not bad things necessarily, but oftentimes good things that have made their way in this season to being ultimate things. And when other things become the ultimate thing, well, sometimes my focus is off. A little blurry. But when we stop to remember, when we gather to worship, when we start our day or end our day or take time in the middle of our day to hear from the Spirit of God through the Word of God, when we take time on a Friday evening to contemplate what Jesus has made possible for us, I always find that to be good for my clarity good for my remembering Jesus, good for my remembering the resolve of Jesus. And what's so amazing about this to me, there were so many people interacting with Jesus when he walked the planet, and the interactions were all, all over the place. And you know that people were projecting their expectations upon Jesus, and if there was anyone who based off of what everybody else was projecting upon him might be tempted to get a little sidetracked for things to be a little blurry or out of focus. It might be Jesus, yet on this night, the day that we call Good Friday, we once again remember with clear resolve, Jesus walked to the cross all by himself. I mean, read through the Gospels for yourself, and what you read is that some people, it's interesting, some people love being around Jesus. You'll read that some people simply wanted to reach out and touch Jesus. You'll read that some fell down before Jesus. You'll read often that people would articulate they've never heard anyone teach or talk like Jesus. You would find people that brought the sick, their sick friends and family to Jesus. And for some, they dropped everything they had and they followed Jesus. And in the midst of all of this, what you also read as you read through the Gospels is you find people who wanted to kill Jesus. Like, that's not an overstatement. People really hated him. We've already heard some of this and what was read earlier tonight, but... Just for recap, here are some verses for you to consider this evening. Matthew twenty two fifteen. 15. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. John 8, 6. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Luke 4, 28. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. Mark 3, 21, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. John 7, 20, you are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who's trying to kill you? John 8, 48, the Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and demon-possessed? John 8, 52, at this the Jews exclaimed, now we know that you're demon-possessed. 
John 10, 20. Many of them said he is demon possessed, raving mad. Why would we listen to him? Luke 6, 11. But they were furious and began discuss, to discuss with one another that, what they might do to Jesus. Luke 4, 29. They got up and drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. John 5, 18. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Mark 3, 6. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Mark eleven sixteen. 16. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Matthew 12, 14. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Luke 19, 47, every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Matthew 21, 46, they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Matthew 26, 4, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. Mark 15, 19, Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Luke twenty two sixty five, 65, and they said many other insulting things to him. Matthew 27, 39, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. Matthew 27, 22, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asked, and they all answered, crucify him. Luke twenty two thirty six. the soldiers also came up and mocked him. Matthew 27, 41. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. Now, you might be thinking, Jason, that's a lot of verses you just read. And yeah, that's the point. So that I can make this point. In the midst of all the people that love Jesus and follow Jesus around and believe that Jesus could heal them, and were so taken aback at his wonderful teaching. There were also people who mocked him, spit on him, thought that he was possessed by a demon, and wanted to kill him. What do we do with those responses? What do those responses tell us about Jesus as we remember him? What do they tell us on this night as we recollect the clear resolve with, with which he walked to the cross on his own? It's been well over a decade now that I read a book by author and pastor Don Everts. And he articulated a couple of things that I've pondered on for years, especially when Good Friday approaches. When I contemplate and think about the resolve of Jesus to walk to the cross, to lay down his life for humanity, including those, interestingly enough, that hated him and wanted him to die. And something that Don said that stuck with me as I read it a long time ago was this. When you process through the gospels and you read all of those verses, what you realize pretty quickly is that Jesus wasn't interested in being a people pleaser. While he definitely loved people, he didn't water down his message or alter his personality to stroke the ego of the people around him, right? He was prophetic, he was real in his ways. And if those ways or his words clash with the assumptions of other people, that would be just fine with Jesus. If his teaching upset people, no problem for Jesus. If he interrupted a good time by speaking the truth, that was okay with Jesus. And if his compassion and mercy ticked off the religious people of the day, that too would be just fine with Jesus. Jesus showed up and said what? Jesus showed up and said, I am the light of the world. And we know that light has a way of revealing and we know that not everyone is thrilled about light that is actually in the darkness. Or said this way, Jesus was the light and some people despised him for it. The other thing we're reminded of when you read through these verses is you're reminded of the integrity of Jesus, right? 
Think about this with me. Jesus was, think about it. Jesus was so far above reproach that even though they threw themselves at him trying to capture him, it didn't happen. They couldn't capture Jesus. The guys who determined the law and the custom and the rule of the day, they couldn't get him even though they were trying over and over again to get him. And I was thinking about this. How many of us could make that claim? If I had an enemy out to get me, I don't think it would be that difficult. There would be no problem in convicting me before a jury of my close friends. For at some point being a jerk, unkind, ungracious, envious, a gossip, the list could go on and on. But with Jesus, isn't it amazing? It was so different. The smartest men in town couldn't trap him. Even though they tried over and over and over again. And I'm not going to take time to walk through it all because we've already read the story tonight. But even when they finally did arrest him, the trial they put on to convict him was the biggest joke ever. They couldn't even get the soldiers to pull off the arrest without them doing what? Falling down before Jesus. They couldn't get anybody to agree with their lies about Jesus during the trial. And in the end, it was this ugly, taped together, fragile set of contradictory lies that convicted Jesus. And when they took their evidence before Pilate, he would have nothing to do with it. He was so innocent. It was so obvious. Pilate said, I'm not going to condemn him. He practically begged Jesus to defend himself and be done with the silly trial. But Jesus just stood there, remained silent as we read earlier. The only way this was going to work to convict and kill Jesus was to stir up this angry mob. And that's what the Pharisees did. And the angst and the anger and the hate of desperate men stood there versus the integrity of Jesus. And I say all of that, I remind us of that tonight because uh, it just reminds me of his resolve to sacrifice his life for me and for you. At each point along the way, from the awkwardness with the Pharisees to the run-ins with his own family to being slapped and beaten and spit on, he could have hesitated, he could have deviated, he could have adjusted the plan a little bit to soften the blow to himself. But he never did. He could have stopped the flogging at any point. He could have unleashed his power to destroy everyone around him. Every time that he was spit on, he could have called down floods from heaven to wipe out those who just spit in his face. He could have called on the angels when he was hanging on the cross, being taunt, taunted and laughed at. And the fact that Jesus evokes so much hate from those around him tells us something about his longing to embrace death on a cross for us. If it were us, here's what you know that I know. It would have left us running for our lives if we would have walked that path. But he never lets up. He never smooths things over. Let me just read this to you. I'll be done. Luke twenty two thirty nine. Then accompanied by his disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room. And he went as usual to the Mount of Olives. And there he told them, pray. You won't give in to temp- that you won't give in to temptation. Verse 41, he walked away about a stone's throw. He knelt down, he prayed, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And then an angel of heaven appeared and strengthened him, and he prayed more fervently. And he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like drops of blood. And at last he stood up, and he returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. But... Even as Jesus said this, a crowd approached led by Judas, one of the 12. And Judas walked over to Jesus to greet him with a kiss. But Jesus said, Judas, would you portray the son of man with a kiss? And when the other disciples saw what was about to happen, they exclaimed, Lord, should we fight? We brought the swords. And one of them struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his right ear. But Jesus said, no, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. 
And then Jesus spoke to the leading priests and the captains of the temple guard and elders who had come from him. Am I some dangerous revolutionary? He asked that you come with me with a sword and clubs to arrest me. Why don't you arrest me at the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. So here you find Jesus on the brink of suffering and sacrifice that none of us could imagine. Listen, not just the beating and the spitting and the taunting, but the weight of ages of human sin slung around his neck. This is what the movie years ago, The Passion of the Christ, that many of us went and saw and thought was so good, but it couldn't convey this. It could show the beating and it could show the taunting, but not what Jesus must have felt about every sin ever committed upon him. And he asked his friends, those closest to him, to watch and pray. And Jesus goes and he throws himself on the ground and one breath asks God to take the cup of suffering from him and still holds to the cup, understanding his Father's will. It's a deep prayer that brings blood to his tears and his friends fall, fail him and they fall asleep over and over again and he wakes them up and he says it's time. And listen, he walks headlong into the slaps and pain and torture and unfathomable penalty for human sin. Like even the soldiers who show up, they botch the arrest. Who walks the soldiers through their arresting of Jesus. Jesus. And all of that, the reason I took the time to talk about it tonight, is so I could ask a question. What should our response be to gathering on Good Friday and remembering the resolve of Jesus? Remembering his willingness to give his life that we might have life. If you're here and you've never said, I want to follow Jesus with my life, then the invitation is for you to follow Jesus. And maybe whoever you came with tonight would love to talk with you about that. I'd love to talk with you about that. If you sit here tonight and you do follow Jesus, I think the response is to simply say, thank you, Jesus. I don't know everything that you bring in with you to a Good Friday service. Lots of things. But one thing that Good Friday is about is remembering the resolve of Jesus. And if you follow Jesus to once again say, thank you, Jesus. You thank him for his resolve and for walking and fighting through so many traps and temptations. Think about it for a second. Think of all the insults. And he never deviated off course. He walked to the cross so that we wouldn't need to. May we thank him for not being a people pleaser like so many of us are, but holding fast to his purpose, even in the midst of people projecting so much upon him. Let us thank him for being the light in the midst of darkness for his purity and his integrity without which he could not fulfill his purpose. Let us thank him that no series of blows and insults and nails and taunts could break his stride toward what he set out to do. Give his life for you and for me. And as we come to take communion tonight, we thank him because without his resolve, each of us would be facing a day in, day out reality of absolutely no hope and an eternity of separation from him. And if you're anything like me, uh, I know that for many of us, giving thanks is not an easy thing. But we kind of walk through this service and go, be thankful? Yeah. I mean, we can say that we're thankful. We can mostly mean it. But we also know that having a soul marked by praise and thanksgiving does not come easily to so many of us. The Apostle Paul talks about overflowing with thanksgiving. I'm not sure if that's you or not. But for most of us, our thanksgiving is dependent on our day-to-day -day circumstances, isn't it? Even coming in here tonight. 
It's dependent on how we're doing. If I'm having a good week, then it's easier to be thankful and feel good about what Jesus has done in me and for me. But if I'm a little depressed or stressed or frustrated by my soul is anything but thankful. I can mouth some words, I can sing some songs, but not on the inside, it doesn't match what's coming out. And Thanksgiving does not come easy when you and I are allowing the state of our heart, mind, and soul to be governed by the winds of circumstances. So how does God transform us, continue to transform us into being a thankful people? Well, I'm not sure of all the ways. I don't have time to list them all. But one is what we're doing tonight, right? Thinking through Jesus paying the penalty for our sin. Do you want to grow in thankfulness for who Jesus is and what Jesus has done? Then remember Jesus. Or maybe I can say it this way. Continue to get clarity about your own sin. Feel free to ask the question and then journal a little bit. How bad is my sin? What do I actually believe about sin? Is sin just being bad and, and doing little things that are fun, but for some reason they're outlawed by God? <laughs> or is sin what Jesus teaches, a dark land of deception, dizziness, slavery, spiritual suicide? Or I could say it this way. The more biblically we understand our own sin, the more intentional our thanksgiving becomes, or as Pastor Don says, a clear theology of sin has been water poured on the weak, dying plant of my thankfulness. So Good Friday, yeah, it's good. And it is good for us to remember what God has done for us in Jesus to remember who we are apart from him who we were apart from him, and as we remember, grow in thankfulness for who we are in him. That he willingly walked to the cross and nothing, I mean nothing, was gonna stop him. So one of the things we love to do on Good Friday is take communion together. We know a lot of you worship with us regularly here, <clears throat> and you're a part of our services on a Sunday morning when we do communion. But we do it a little bit different on Good Friday, and I'm always so thankful for that. As you came in the back of either auditorium, uh, there were the communion elements there. So in just a moment, if you didn't grab those, you can go and grab them. And I want to say this just real quickly. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're welcome to take communion with us, even if Fellowship Greenville is not your church home. If you're at home, now's the time to grab those elements as well. And here's what we're gonna encourage you to do just over the next five minutes. We want you to gather in smaller groups, whether it's your family um, or a group of friends, maybe your community groups together, maybe it's just the people around you. And we're gonna have a couple of prompts on the screen in Odd One and in Odd Two and online if you're watching there. And somebody in your group could maybe kind of lead the group in taking the elements. It'll all be on the screens for you. And then take a moment and pray together in prayer of thanksgiving and thankfulness. And after just a few minutes, we'll come together and we'll close and sing another song or two together, all right? So go ahead and move into your groups if you want to do that. Go grab the elements there and then turn your attention to the screens for the prompts.